right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so before I get into my talk, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so my name is Ryan Mackey, and I'm originally from uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, while I was there, I actually got a degree in political science at Colorado State University. Uh, and if you've been following the news lately, it's pretty uh, obvious why I got into web development instead. Uh, but so now I'm a front-end developer working for IBM on their cloud platform down in Austin, Texas. Um, so I've basically gone from spending my entire uh, winter in my apartment to spending my entire summer in my apartment. <laughs> it's really hot down there. Uh, but so yeah, I started IBM about a year ago, and uh, I'm immediately paired up with a senior developer over there named uh, Jason Langstorff. And at the time, Jason was super excited about GraphQL, uh, specifically Apollo's implementation of a uh, GraphQL client and server. Um, and after I started playing around with it uh, for a little bit, I got really excited about it as well. And uh, I'll tell you why, kind of give you the, uh, you know, the elevator pitch for GraphQL here. Um, so if you're brand new to it, this is kind of where it starts. Um, we have these queries, uh, we write them out, and we describe exactly what data we want and in the order we want it. Um, so this eliminates the problem of overfetching. Uh, when you're making that call to the API, you're just getting exactly the data you want, nothing more, nothing less. And because of those type definitions on the server side, we uh, get these like built-in IDEs for development, which is really great. And the big thing with the Apollo client is that the entire request cycle is handled for you. So we attach these queries to our React components, and then if the component is in flight, it'll tell us it's loading. If we have any errors, we get those errors right there. And then otherwise, if we got the data, we just print it right out. Uh, there's, yeah, no setting up any like fetch calls, waiting for like chunk hashes to load or whatever. Um, it's just right there for you. And another huge thing about it is like zero config caching. So the way that Apollo works when it uh, you know, tries to execute a query is one, uh, the query is loaded from the client side data store. Uh, but if they already have it, um, or if, no, I'm sorry, if they don't have it, they'll go ahead and get it from the server. And then your component subscribes to the store. So if there's any changes or the data mutates at all, then that's uh, you know, rendered uh, immediately on your component. So I was really excited about this, and we wanted to start somewhere to get some buy-in from the higher-ups, and we uh, ended up starting with a uh, you know, proof of concept. Uh, so I'm going to try to show you a video here. And uh, before I get into that, let me set the scene a little bit. Um, so this is the IBM Cloud usage dashboard. Uh, so it's where users can go to uh, like get breakdowns of their costs, you know, for uh, all their apps and whatnot. And um, the page uh, was built initially in Dojo uh, back when they were trying to get you know IBM Bluemix off the ground, and uh, it needed a little uh, you know TLC. <laughs> um, so over on the left, you know, we have the impl uh, initial implementation. Oh, the video is not going. Oh no! Let's try this. There we go. So over on the left, we have the initial implementation, and then over on the right, we have it rebuilt in React using GraphQL. Um, and so, because of that, uh, we were able to ex show an explorable UI after just 1.4 seconds, and you know, render some skeleton components uh, because we knew exactly like when the queries were going to be in flight. And then after about 18 seconds, the rest of the data came in. Uh, and then over on the left, uh, kind of a spoiler alert, but it takes another like 15 seconds. <laughs> um, so it was a huge performance improvement. And uh, this account is like a, uh, like a real worst case scenario as far as performance goes. Um, it's, a, it's a test account for development, so it's just filled with junk, takes forever. And then because of that zero config caching, um, when a user already had that account loaded, they could switch between accounts really fast. Um, so, is that actually playing? Yeah. So over on the right, you know, we switch back to an account that we had already loaded. It loads right away. Over on the left, uh, it's got to do that request cycle all over again. 
And so we were really uh, excited from the results of our proof of concept, and we wanted to put it into production immediately. You know, we wanted to rip out our entire middle tier and just replace it with GraphQL. Um, but not everybody was on board. Um, you know, other teams immediately started voicing concerns, and a number of really good questions were raised, um, which is a good thing because we were thinking about, you know, uh, just the endpoint, not exactly what it would take to get there. Um, and so before we get into how we actually accomplish that, let me set the scene a little bit. Um, so IBM Cloud is built with a uh, node microservice architecture. Um, there are about 30 plus microservice teams currently, and uh, each microservice or plugin is a separate code base. Um, there's a, a couple shared NPM modules for things like uh, you know, session management and authorization. Uh, but for the most part, uh, teams are able to pretty easily control their own workflow. Uh, but at the same time, this also has its downsides. Um, things can change in 30 plus directions at any given time. Um, building a new UI from scratch means you have to hunt down the data that you're looking for, you know, across like documentation and things like that. Um, and when you do actually find that documentation, there's a good chance it's going to be out of date, um, incomplete, or both, which is really terrible. And uh, because code can be so wildly inconsistent between microservices, um, it presents a lot of problems to the user. You know, when you're browsing IBM Cloud, there's a good chance you're probably going to load uh, jQuery, uh, Dojo, React, Angular, uh, Angular 5. Um, <laughs> and then probably whatever framework is going to be popular six months from now. Uh, but some, so GraphQL had some solutions for this. Um, changes are centralized in the GraphQL microservice. You know, it's all over just that one slash GraphQL endpoint. And being able to cut down on the amount of HTTP requests we're uh, firing off uh, is going to be good for uh, performance. And documentation is uh, centralized and consistent. You know, that, that schema I was talking about earlier, uh, any updates we make to that are immediately available in that in-browser IDE. And there's a cleaner separation between uh, the data layer and the presentation layer. Um, with, uh, with GraphQL, we're pretty much able to focus entirely on the presentation, so it really helps us to deliver a you know, better user experience. Uh, but at the enterprise scale, there were some complications with that. So the first big question we had to ask was, who actually owns the GraphQL microservice? Uh, would every team just have to hand over control of their data to this one team uh, and just be at the whim of this gatekeeper? Uh, how can teams make independent changes? You know, are they going to be waiting for like a handful of people to review their code before they can make any changes to it? Could one bad commit take down the entire service? And uh, doesn't an extra layer actually make it harder to trace errors? So we wanted the benefits of GraphQL, but we had to ask ourselves, could we afford the trade-offs? Uh, we needed answers. Uh, so mainly, can we um, centralize data, but let teams still keep control of their own data? Could we design an approach that actually improves error handling instead of making it more obtuse? Uh, make, it so teams, make it so easy to use that teams actually want to switch over to it. And finally, uh, could we build a service that can handle IBM scale? I mean, currently we're operating at about half a dozen data centers around the world, uh, so we really needed to make sure it was robust before we you know, started using it. That was the wrong button. <laughs> There we go. All right. <laughs> uh, so for the first challenge, how do we centralize data but decentralize control of that data? So in a, in a perfect world, each team would be able to maintain their own GraphQL schema and have that schema aggregated into a central microservice for everybody to use. Uh, so if this was going to work, we needed a, a standardized format for sharing these schemas. And we ended up calling these data sources. Um, really original, I know. Uh, but so could, let me kind of walk you through what makes up a data source for us. So it starts with uh, schema and resolvers. 
And if you have ever done like a tutorial about how to throw together an Apollo server, um, the, those are kind of the two things it tells you how to do. And then everything outside of that is just kind of left up to your own imagination. Um, but thanks to a, um, uh, an article we really liked from a guy named Jonas Helfer about how to structure GraphQL servers, we added a model and a connector. Uh, the model just being like, you know, basic CRUD operations, you know, so get, post, put, delete. And a connector, which just uh, tells the data source where it's actually going to point to to get the data from, so like a you know, base URI. And then so we wrap all of that in a common export, and then, uh, yeah, that was our, you know, standardized format for it. Uh, but so each data source is an independent GitHub repo, meaning uh, there's no bottlenecks. Each team is able to commit and deploy code independently. Uh, there's no loss of control. Uh, each team owns their own data source, no gatekeepers or anything. And there's no accidental borking. So uh, uh, each team's code has individual test suites. So if they have a, you know, a breaking build, we know that we can't pull that into the, you know, the main microservice. And then so our next you know, question for this was how do we actually combine these data sources into a uh, you know, central microservice? And our solution for this ended up being a, a library we launched called Gramps. Um, so that's, <laughs> it's a hard acronym, but uh, GraphQL Apollo Microservice Patterns Server. Uh, the joke with it being get your data off my lawn. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's the GitHub and NPM if you want to check it out after this. Uh, but yeah, so we have all these data sources. We plug them into the Gramps middleware. Uh, that sits on top of an Apollo server, and then uh, we expose that over the, uh, you know, the slash GraphQL endpoint. And the implementation for this actually ended up being so easy that you could fit it on a single slide, uh, assuming you use a really tiny font, which it did. <laughs> so um, we're going to start with a, you know, a super basic Apollo server. Um, you can see we have uh, you know, just like one endpoint on there, just slash, slash GraphQL. We put in our express middleware, attach a schema and context, and that's about as bare bones as it gets. So to use Gramps, we just got to import the library. Uh, you know, set it up in a you know initial object there. Uh, we remove our local copies of a you know a schema and context, and then replace that with uh, uh, packages that we've imported from npm. Uh, you see, we have that little uh, Gramps namespace there, uh, and then we just plug those into a data sources array, and then uh, yeah, instead of just uh, you know the uh, attaching that manually, we just pass in our uh, GraphQL options object, and that's it. Pretty easy. So our second challenge with, the, with that was actually how do we improve error handling? Um, so we asked ourselves, what makes an error helpful? Um, so a clear description of what went wrong, which is you know, probably the most important thing for actually being able to debug this. Uh, clarity about where the error actually occurred. You know, so did it happen on the uh, on the microservice itself or one of the endpoints that it's trying to hit? Uh, information to help with tracing bugs. You know, so like links to documentation, status codes, things like that. And uh, unique IDs shared on the client and the server side, so we're able to you know quickly reference them when we're going over the server logs. Uh, so client side, that's what you get with Gramps. Um, you get you know the ID, description, docs link, whatever else. Um, but we know that we can't always show all of that data in production. Um, for example, your docs link might be behind your firewall, which is a pretty common use case, at least for us. Um, and uh, the target endpoint may not be public. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily a secret, but not something you want to advertise to everybody. Um, so in production, we go ahead and strip those out. Um, but you still get that unique ID, uh, so you can quickly reference it on the uh, server logs and find exactly what you're looking for. Uh, but what this, in, what this ended up meaning for us was errors are normalized across all data sources. So even when you're just doing a human read of those server logs, um, it's all very consistent. And you're easily able to tell you know, exactly what you're looking for. Uh, support tickets can directly reference details in the logs you know, using that unique ID. Uh, errors are clear and come with documentation, which uh, you know we're kind of working on. <laughs> um, it's it's a process, uh, but the source of a given error is immediately clear. Um, you know exactly where it happened, 
uh, and uh, yeah. But so moving on to the third challenge was how do we make it so easy that teams actually want to use it? Because um, you know if it's hard, they're just not gonna do it. They're gonna keep you you know you doing REST APIs the exact same way they have, and uh, nobody would ever adopt it. So if we wanted it to be you know teams to start using it, we had to make it dead simple. And what we did for that initially was a data source starter kit. Um, so it was a really great starting point for making a new GraphQL data source. And it had a step-by-step -step tutorial for building a new data source, you know, like what strings you need to replace with your own, uh, you know, like namespace and things like that. And uh, you got test coverage starting at 100%. And the really interesting thing about these data sources is that once you have that completely green coverage map, you tend to want to keep it that way. So <laughs> a lot of people have, which has been great. And it comes pre-configured for Travis CI and Code Climate. Um, for Travis, you just have to turn it on, and then Code Climate, you just had to like grab an ID or something. Um, and that's the link to the, the GitHub repo for the data source base. Uh, but so now it's actually even easier than that. Um, thanks to you know, uh, one of my favorite NPM features, NPX, and uh, a library called GraphQL CLI, uh, we were able to reduce all of that down to a single command. And uh, then you just get asked a couple questions and you know, it'll uh, replace all the strings for you. And then for local development, we also developed a, uh, a CLI to make that a little easier. Um, so with this, you could run your data sources locally, um, include a gateway to a GraphQL server, and um, you could even run it with mock data by just doing a dash dash mock flag. Um, but there was a snag with that initially. Um, so if you have a gateway to a GraphQL microservice and that data source is already installed on that one, um, then the, all of the types would collide, and that would you know, just be a headache for you. Uh, so we added a, the ability to let you override those data sources by just you know, specifying that. Um, but we did also include a disclaimer, um, just so people know that it's not production code and that you're just running the data source locally. Uh, so we give you a nice clean readout of you know, what, what exactly is going on. And so the fourth challenge was, how do we actually build for the global scale? Um, and we actually didn't have to do much. Apollo's Express server just kind of worked, so that was pretty great. Yeah. I like that, Jeff. <laughs> Um, but so we started working on the GraphQL microservice back in May. Uh, it hit production in July. And then uh, we went open source with Gramps back in October. Um, and one of the cool like bonuses that we got is that the schema stitching ended up actually being really easy with Gramps. Um, if you're not familiar, it's just a way for you to like take a GraphQL schema and then extend that you know, by adding your own fields. Uh, to that data, um, so you don't have to, you know, do any complicated like, you know, merging of those two on the front end. Um, but yeah, so again, uh, it's Gramps. Definitely get involved. You know, make data sources, submit pull requests. Uh, we're always looking for more help with it. Uh, but yeah, that's about my time. Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>